Nerds, welcome back. My name is Nate in the Wild. So listen, I've been a professional photographer full time for about eight years now. And throughout the course of my career, I've gotten to the point where my camera feels just like an extension of my hand. I don't have to think about where the buttons and dials are or what they do. I can just casually adjust the settings on the fly to create the image I want. But all this came as the result of a lot of practice and a lot of trial and error. Getting started in photography, buying your first camera, figuring out how it all works can be really overwhelming. So today I wanna to talk through the basics of photography and what settings on your camera can be used to create great images right out of the box. So even if you're brand new to photography, you've likely heard that the goal is to get the correct exposure, right? But what exactly does that mean? So exposure is just a term for how bright or dark an image is and under or overexposed means exactly what it sounds like. Underexposed is too dark, and overexposed is too bright. Simple, right? So cameras have three main mechanisms for controlling and adjusting exposure, commonly referred to as the exposure triangle. Each of the three components of the exposure triangle have a primary purpose, which is to make the image brighter or darker, but all three also have a secondary outcome when you adjust them, which we'll talk about a bit later in this video. At the top of the exposure triangle is shutter speed. The shutter on a camera opens and closes for a set amount of time, which allows light to hit the image sensor. Think of it like blinds over a window. Longer shutter speed means more light, and therefore a brighter exposure. The number will often look like this, which is the fraction of a second that the shutter is open. For example, 1 100th or 1 over 100. Shorter shutter speed means less time with the blinds open and therefore a darker image. The secondary function of shutter speed relates to how it captures motion, as a long shutter speed can create motion blur of moving subjects. This is often very desirable, such as for moving water or clouds, but rarely desirable for things like people and animals. I would encourage you to play around with shutter speed in different scenarios to get a feel for it, but as a general rule of thumb, you can shoot around 1 100th of a second for still life and non-moving objects, 1 over 500 for slow moving subjects, 1 over 1000 for sports and action, and 1 over 2000 for fast moving wildlife like birds. Shutter speeds of one second or longer would be considered long exposures and are fantastic for stuff like waterfalls or even longer for night skies. For shutter speeds slower than 1 25th of a second, however, you're gonna wanna use a tripod because camera motion will make for the entire image to be blurry. Shutter speed can be adjusted from the menu in your camera on the back screen or with one of the dials on top. For Sony cameras, the default dial is the one towards the back where your thumb will be. Next up on the exposure triangle is aperture. Aperture refers to the opening in the lens and how much light will get through. A wider aperture lets in more light, of course, creating a brighter image, and a smaller aperture lets in less light, making a darker image. The naming convention is reverse correlated, so for some reason a smaller number like f2 is a wider aperture, and a higher number like f16 is a very small aperture. The secondary function of aperture is called depth of field, which refers to how much of the image is in focus. A wide aperture like f2.8 is great for stuff like portraits with lots of blurry background and foreground, and a smaller aperture like f16 is great for scenes where you want everything in focus, like landscapes. Aperture on Sony cameras is the wheel closest to the shutter button in the front, but it can also be adjusted on the back screen or in the menu. The last portion of the exposure triangle is ISO, which some people will pronounce as a word, like ISO. ISO controls the brightness of the image directly from the image sensor itself, with lower numbers being darker and higher numbers being brighter. In bright sun, you'll wanna shoot at ISO 100, but in dark scenarios like after sunset or indoors, you'll need higher ISO values like 1600. And for astrophotography, you'll want your ISO around 4000. Now the secondary function of ISO is grain. Higher ISO will lead to a noisier, grainier image. Uh, film grain can look really nice in some images, but in general, we try to avoid noisy images caused by high ISO, so I try to keep my ISO low and adjust other settings to get the proper exposure. ISO can be adjusted with the thumb wheel on the back of the camera or again in the camera settings menu. Now that we've covered the exposure triangle, let's talk about using those settings on the camera. 
The most important dial when learning photography is the mode dial on your camera. Now you may have heard something like, real photographers shoot in manual mode, but that's kind of nonsense, and it's not really the best for every scenario. The little M on the top dial stands for manual mode, but the other settings near it are some of the absolute best, especially while learning. So to start, the auto stands, of course, for automatic, and this means that the camera will automatically adjust ISO, shutter speed, and aperture for you, and all you really need to think about is pointing and clicking. This is fine, and it's actually great if you're learning and you just want to focus on practicing composition. The P stands for Program Auto, where you get to pick the exposure, and as you adjust one of the settings, the camera will adjust the other two settings to keep the exposure correct. A stands for Aperture Priority, which means exactly what you think. In this setting, you have control over the aperture only, and the camera will adjust the shutter speed and ISO. Of course, the S stands for Shutter Priority, and using this will allow you to adjust the shutter speed and let the camera compensate the aperture and ISO. These are excellent, excellent tools to learn the settings of your camera, because you can focus on adjusting your shutter speed or aperture individually, and see how they affect your final images without worrying about blowing the exposure. Now, my favorite secret is that in manual mode, you can still set your ISO to auto, so you can practice adjusting your shutter speed and aperture together while still letting your camera help a little bit. It's a fantastic way to learn and practice. I still use auto ISO all the time in the field when shooting fast-moving wildlife in action because I want control over my aperture and shutter speed to control my depth of field and motion blur, but I don't always have time to adjust all three corners of the exposure triangle with a fast-moving animal moving through the frame. This next dial on top is called the Exposure Compensation Dial, or EV Comp. This tells the camera how you want it to expose the images when one or more of your settings is automatic. Theoretically, zero will be a perfectly exposed image, but of course cameras are not perfect, so you may find that this is off occasionally. If you're shooting a dark subject with a bright background, you may find the image comes out quite underexposed, and conversely, a bright subject with a dark background may end up significantly overexposed. In general, I'll shoot my landscapes with an exposure value of negative 0.5 to negative 0.7, so that sky highlights are not overexposed, because I can easily recover the shadows while editing. Now, speaking of editing, this brings us to the eternal debate of RAW versus JPEG. You may have heard that it's mandatory to shoot in RAW to get good images, but again, that's really not true. RAW images are exactly what they sound like. They're raw, meaning they have the maximum amount of data and pixel information in the image, so they have potential to be a better finished photo if you take the time to properly edit, but if you don't know how to edit, or you don't want to edit, then a raw photo will not look anything like the scene that you just photographed to your naked eye. It's sort of like saying that a Wendy's burger is worse than buying everything from the store. That's possibly true, but you still have to go through the effort of preparing and cooking. Sometimes you just want a fast burger. When shooting in JPEG, your camera basically does the editing for you. It produces an image that will more or less replicate how the scene looks to you in person. I think shooting in JPEG is an excellent way to learn your camera settings and figure out how shutter speed, ISO, and aperture affect your image. If you're trying to learn editing at the same time as you're trying to learn the exposure triangle, it may be tough to determine if the error on your bad shots is from camera settings or from your editing. So shooting in JPEG is a great way to remove one of the variables and just focus on the thing that you're trying to practice. Another very important setting to pay attention to is the white balance. White balance refers to the warmth of your image, and warmth basically just means yellowness. A warmer image will have more yellows and oranges, and a cooler image will have stronger blues and greens. I spend probably 90% of the time on auto white balance, or AWB, because cameras are generally really good at choosing an appropriate white balance for any given scene. The three main white balance modes to pay attention to are daylight, shade, and cloudy. Daylight will be fairly neutral, trending cooler, shade will be very warm, and cloudy is neutral, trending towards warmer. The incandescent setting will be very blue when you're outdoors, but it's 
perfect for shooting indoors with artificial lighting. Now, as you get more advanced, you may consider scrolling all the way down and trying custom white balance settings. When measuring white balance in degrees Kelvin, the lower numbers like 2600 degrees Kelvin will be very cool, whereas higher numbers like 6000 degrees Kelvin will be very warm. Drive mode changes the speed at which images are taken. Single shooting means the camera will take exactly one image each time you press the shutter button. Continuous shooting means the camera will continuously shoot images as long as the shutter is held down. Continuous shooting comes with several different speed tiers, and it will vary greatly from camera to camera, but in general I'll use continuous shooting for wildlife and action sports, and single shooting for landscapes, portraits, food, and so on. There's also the self timer option, which allows you to set a 2, 5, or 10 second delay between when you press the shutter and when the camera takes the image. This is, of course, very helpful for selfies and group shots, but also great for long exposures on a tripod where you don't want the action of pressing the shutter to move the camera. The last thing I want to talk about today is autofocus settings. The camera will allow you to choose a variety of focus zones, with the smaller ones being helpful when you need a very precise focusing on a single object, but very difficult for moving subjects. For wildlife or action, I'll use the zone focus option, which creates a box on the screen that's large enough to keep the subject in, but not so large that the camera gets confused and focuses on unintended objects. You also get to choose between AFS and AFC. AFS stands for autofocus single, and the camera will focus once as you push the shutter and then take the image. AFC is continuous autofocus, where the camera will continuously refocus and track your subject no matter how many images you take. I use AFC almost exclusively, as I spend the majority of my time shooting moving objects, but even for landscapes, AFC is fine because once the camera is focused, you simply press the shutter the rest of the way. There is, of course, much, much more we could talk about for camera settings, but those are all the major ones to get you started. I hope you found this helpful and that it helps get you started down the right path using your new camera. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments down below, and until I see you next time, stay nerdy.